I agree. Shalom. Peace be with you. Um, so, I don't know, we get closer and closer to Christmas. I'm feeling more like a kid. Uh, it's just that time of year, you know, the rumors of snow and the Christmas tree up and it's kind of a wonderful thing to just pull the old ornaments out and reminisce about where you got them and it's just a magical time of the year and um, hopefully the joy of the Lord is with you but uh, we also want to talk about the peace of the Lord and in the the reading we just did uh, there there is some good word in there and uh, hopefully we uh, get a chance to just uh, I think what I'll end up doing is taking that and posting it onto the Facebook too. It might be long, but I think it's something that you know we might want to reference back as well. So today's message, um, we kind of started Second Thessalonians before Advent happened, and uh, rather than just quitting and jumping over, we're still pressing through it. Uh, the goal is to finish out Second uh, Thessalonians today. We're going to cover the rest of the verses, but pretty much just focus on the first one for the message today. But, uh, but we're going to get through it all. So uh, let us uh, read through 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3, verses 6 through 18. Now we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother or sister who leads a disorderly life and not one in accordance with the, with the traditions which you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example, because we did not act in an undisciplined way among you, nor did, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship we kept work night and day, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have the right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a role model for you, so that you will follow our example. For even when we were with you, we used to give you uh, this order. Uh, we used to give you this order: if anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading a undisciplined life, doing no work at all but acting like busybodies. Now we command and exhort such persons in the Lord Jesus Christ to work peacefully and eat their own bread. But as for you, brothers and sisters, do not grow weary of doing good. If anyone does not obey our instructions in this letter, take special note of that person so as, to, uh, so as not to associate with him, so that he will be put to shame. And yet, do not regard the person as an enemy, uh, but admonish that one as a brother or sister. Now may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstances. The Lord be with you. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand, and this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. That is the way I write. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you always. Let's open in prayer. Father God, we just praise you, and we thank you, and we exalt you, and we glorify you, and we bless you. And Father God, we, we just ask for your peace to fill this space, to fill our hearts, to fill this message, to fill in our, our fellowship and our friendships with one another. Uh, we ask for your peace when called upon to admonish one another, to point out areas that need work, that need surrender, that need to be died to. And so, Lord, we, um, we just thank you for this word. We thank you for this season as we lead up to the celebration of your birth. And we just pray that this word would resonate in our lives and lead to transformation and growth. That we would leave here somehow different, somehow closer to you. And we just praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So today's Advent reading is on peace. And I think this scripture um, ties in pretty well with it. You know, at least in my opinion. I think this scripture is a... Um, 
a good instruction on how we are to maintain our peace that God has given us. Now we started off by reading verse 6 where it says, uh, Now we command you, command's a pretty strong word, but it says we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother or sister who leads a disorderly life, and not one in accordance with the traditions which you receive from us. It's important to realize that Paul is referencing the brothers and sisters. He's talking about other believers. And a lot of times it's easy for us to say, well, you know, the disorderly in my life are the non-believers. But it's really the people that are professing to be believers that are disorderly that we have to be especially careful with. And, and Paul points this out. Um, it's important to realize that we can be justified, we can be made holy, um, and we can be saved by the blood of Christ long before we're made perfect. You know, long before the point of entire sanctification where we surrender all to Christ, between that point and between Lord come into my heart, there's a lot of mess in our lives. You know, and most of the people we interact with are going to have some mess in their lives. And it's not saying, you know, reject them. But we need to be aware of the chaos in their lives. We need to be aware of uh, the areas that they are not walking in line with the scripture and be cautious that we do not hold hands with them and skip in that same you know, deceit and, and um, uh, insubordination of the scripture. So you know, as an example, if anybody comes through this door and they are one day clean and sober and they just want a relationship with the Christ, you know, and they, they drop to their knees and they say, Lord, come into my heart. Praise God, we want, we want more people like that to come. Um, and as, as we fellowship with them and we, you know, try to build each other up, it doesn't mean I'm going to go out on a night on the town with them and either encourage them to stumble or allow them to make me stumble. We have to be really careful about that influence that comes in. So let's talk about the word disorderly as um, used in this reference here. So disorderly in one definition says irregular, uh, irregular or disorderly. In another definition, it's defined as lazy in idleness, refusing to work. So either disorderly, um, kind of irregular or chaotic, or lazy are, are the two meanings here. When we turn to uh, in second, I'm sorry, in uh, in verse six, I, I took the opportunity to look at a couple of other uh, translations of it, which is sometimes helpful, especially when you look at the definition of the word and see how it's been used in other translations. Um, in the NIV version, it says, In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive. Idle and disruptive. In uh, the NASB 95, it words it slightly differently. Uh, leads an unruly life is the way it's being described. The bottom line is we're being ordered or commanded to... Uh, to be careful not to let the disorderly, the laziness, the actions of others influence us that we may take on those traits. And the question is why? Why is this so important? Well, Paul answers it. Um, because they're not in accordance with the traditions and the writings of the scriptures. We're all supposed to be following the scripture. Following the scripture is what's best for us even when we don't like it. It's what's best for us. It is, by definition, what is good. Um, so Jesus ate with sinners. He ate with prostitutes and tax collectors. Uh, you know, he spent time with them, fellowshipping with them. Oh, not fellowship them, but, but, you know, interacting with them. But it was the disciples that were part of his inner circle. He was very selective on who really had access to him you know, who he really poured himself out to. 
there's wisdom in really controlling the circle of influence in your life. Um, if we look at the aspect of lazy in the definition that we just read uh, of disorderly, uh, we're commanded to stay away from those who do not work. Uh, I think this can mean, in some degree, when you say do not work, it can refer to spiritual works. You know, it, it's one thing to say, I'm, not, I'm just going to not provide for myself and starve. But we're also, I believe, talking about people not producing spiritual works. There's a lot of people out there that say, I love Jesus, I am a follower of Christ, but there is zero evidence in their life that that is a true statement. You know, or there may be some evidence, but it's really sparse. You know, so we, we need to um, not be disorderly, we need to be producing work, and that work should also be spiritual works. We should have some fruit in our lives, right? And so if, if you put this uh, equation up here, laziness or disorderly equals not producing spiritual works or fruit, which we're all called to do. It's the evidence of who we are. So when we read through this, I think verse 8 gives us a clear indication that this is what he's really referring to is the laziness of it. Because he says... Um, Verse 8 uh, gives an indication that when, um, I'm sorry, uh, nor did we eat or drink bread without paying for it, but with labor and hardship we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to you. So he's really referring to this whole, you need to be putting some effort in, you need to be doing some work. Um, and I think, again, the reason why he's writing this letter is, you know, it's a recap to the verse book of this, our first chapter, is he gave this message on Jesus coming back and everybody get ready. And then I believe that there were a large number of people that said, hey, Jesus is coming back. I'm just going to sit here under this tree and wait for it. You know, well, I'm not going to do anything because he's going to be coming back pretty soon. Um, or they may have had that attitude of, well, God's going to provide for me, so I'm just going to do nothing. I'll just sit back and wait for the provisions to come. You know, I'll, I'll eat manna. I'll just wait for my manna. And I think Paul is saying, no, <laughs> that's not what we're called to do. We're called to be servants. We're called to be workers for the Lord. We're called uh, to roll up our sleeves and, and go out there and, and spread the gospel. Um, and, I, and I think this is something that we see in the church today. Capital C Church, not so much here. I'm not trying to focus on us, but in the church global today, we can see this attitude of, um, oh, I don't really share the gospel with people because that's the pastor's job. He's the one that's supposed to be telling people about Jesus. I'm just supposed to show up and get fed. You know, this is like a buffet, right? And, and we, sometimes we have that attitude, or, or we might have an attitude of, um, you know, yes, I could help with the kids, the ushering, the whatever the job is that needs to be done, but I'm really not the best qualified for that. So I'm going to let somebody else who's more qualified do that instead. You know, and it's, it's that attitude that can sink in that prevents us from doing work that results in us being lazy, spiritually lazy and disorderly. And, and, and that's not how it's supposed to work. Um, I visualized a when I was a youth um, how we used to do the tug of wars. Everybody here do a tug of war at least once in their life with the rope. When you're on a tug of war, you don't have to be the strongest person. That's okay if you're not. You just need to focus on your section of the rope. You need to get a firm grip of it and you need to pull as hard as you can. Focus on your section. And don't trip anybody else up in the process because your legs are flailing. You know, and, and the church should be like a tug of war. You know, we, should be we should be looking for a section of open rope, grabbing onto it, and pulling for the Lord. And there's so many ways. I mean, God has given each and every one of us spiritual gifts. 
you know, and sometimes we recognize them, sometimes we don't. How are you applying those gifts? How are you working? How are you undisorderly and producing for the Lord? Yes, we're supposed to love and witness to the unsaved. And, you know, we're, we're called to be the salt of the earth. And we talked about that recently, and frankly, it, it, it's been resonating in my head ever since. Um, the S stood for show love. The A stood for ask questions. Anybody remember what the L stands for? Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Listen, that's right. And what was the T for? Turn the subject to Jesus, right on. Yay! Uh, we're called to do all that. We're called to be the salt. You know, that's exciting stuff right there. Um, but today we're talking about peace and disorderly people. So if we turn now to Titus 3, 9 through 11, it says, But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law. For they are useless and worthless. Reject a divisive person after a first and second warning. Know that such a person has uh, deviated from what is right and is sinning, being self-condemned. So there's a lot of scripture in here that's warning us about fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord that are off the path or maybe never quite got on the path. I want all of us <clears throat> to love the lost, you know, for all of us to um, help those that struggle with addiction and infidelity and perversion and lies and all of that. But we're to love them not at the cost of our self-harm. We need to love them in a way where we preserve our testimony. You know, it's one thing to love someone enough to lay down your life for them. But we need to love them sufficiently without endangering our spiritual walk. That's something that we need to fiercely protect, even more than our life. And I you know, know that sometimes we all have these kind of struggles. I'm, I'm with you, you know, and there are people in our lives that are perhaps chaotic or are you know they have professed to be christians at one point in their life and their fruit isn't quite there and it's hard it's hard because people will say you know but they're my child you know they're they're my cousin they're my lifelong friend can i really you know follow this commandment to to isolate from them and I would say, just because you're not running around doing stuff with them, it doesn't mean you're still not praying for them. It doesn't mean you're not lifting them up or offering them encouragement. You just have to be guarded. You need to protect your peace. 1 Corinthians 10, 26-33 For the earth is the Lord's, and all it contains. If one of the unbelievers invites you and you go to eat uh, and, and you want to go, eat anything that is set before you without asking questions for the sake of conscience. But if anyone says to you, this is me sacrificed by idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I wanted to include this because this is evidence that um, if an unbeliever invites you, go. Don't isolate yours. Don't be so protective that you fail to extend the love, you know, the, the hand of kindness and compassion to others. If someone invites you and you want to go, go be with them. But when we talk about, you know, the meat rolls and the don't causing others to stumble, anything that somebody thinks might be wrong is wrong for them. And don't encourage them to do it. Anything that you are uncertain about, that it might be wrong or it might be a threat, don't do it because it is wrong for you. And the point of this is, 
when you have these kind of struggles and you go against things that may or may not be uh, okay and you're uncertain, now you're allowing that chaos to be internalized. Now you have that internal struggle of, I don't know if that was right or wrong, I don't know. And that's when your peace comes under threat. When the chaos outside is allowed inside. So, you know, with all means, you know, yes, I will eat your barbecued pork. Thank you very much. Um, but I know some people that, you know, have adopted the old ways and think that pork is not okay. Shrimp is not okay. And if that's the case, then praise God, I will not cause you to stumble. Nor will I allow myself to stumble because I'm walking hand in hand with you. Um, let's turn to uh, Romans 14. Doing pretty good on time. So then, we pursue the things that make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the person who eats and, cause, and causes offense. It is, good to, it is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother or sister stumbles. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is the one who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But the one who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. And whatever is not from faith is sin. Pursue the things which makes peace and the building up of one another. I am so grateful for the peace of the Lord. Yes. And, and when I feel it slipping, I notice. <laughs> and I don't like that. And, and I need to be aware of it, and I need to fight for it. And I need to make sure that I love you enough to help you fight for your peace and not be a threat to it. I never want to be a threat to anybody else's peace. So don't do what you think may be wrong. Don't encourage others to do what they think may be wrong. Even if the scripture is clear that it's not wrong, they may be unaware of the scripture or they may still be you know, trying to internalize it or it conflicts with things that they believe. Um, that's fine. If that's what you think, then we'll do that. Love. Love is demonstrated. Love is repeated. Love is consistent. And love leads to peace. And I say that because it takes many, many, many acts of love in order to earn trust. It takes one act of disorder, of chaos, yeah. to destroy it all. Yeah. And so we need to become arbiters of peace. People need to be able to trust us. I can't be kind to you most of the time, but that other time, watch out. Because when you see me, you will say that person is not a person of peace. I am going to flee now. Um, I don't know if you've ever, you know, watched the news where they're interviewing the, the neighbor of, uh, you know, a murderer, serial killer, whatever. Usually they'll say stuff like, they were a really nice guy. They were quiet. They were considerate. You know, they were always so helpful. You know, 99% of the time they were wonderful people. But that 1% of the time they were a serial killer. Yeah. And um, no matter how good the 99% was, they're a serial killer. <laughs> That's it. Um, you really dismiss everything else. And so if we want to be, you know, ambassadors of peace, we need to do it all the time. We need to be guarded against anger outbursts. We need to be guarded against, you know, little things that cause people to stumble all the time. We need to be prayerful that, you know, God would help us be true ambassadors of peace all the time. Peace is defined as harmony, 
tranquility. And in certain contexts in the Old Testament, uh, it's the, uh, referred to as shalom, which is welfare, health, and freedom from worry. When we read these definitions, there's no mention here of absence of conflict. That's not what peace is. You know, if you watch the news, they talk about war and peace as if those two are the extremes. But really, they're in different ballparks altogether. Um, peace is, as we just said, you know, harmony, tranquility. It's really an internal thing. Peace is internal. Because peace is an internal thing, praise God, we are blessed to have peace during war. We are blessed to have freedom of, from worry during a battle. We are blessed to have harmony and tranquility even in the face of destruction. Because peace is internalized. That's why, you know, you can be just surrounded. It's like peace is a, 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 our outer shell. And uh, if we're an M&M, you know, the pieces, the chocolate on the inside. Everything outside that outer shell can just be raging with anger. As long as we don't let it break that shell and come inside, we can still have that peace. Colossians 3.15 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as a member of one, uh, member of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Luke 10, 4 through 6 says, And whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a, if a man of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. You ever think about this one a little bit? Yeah. You ever? So, I mean, the way I, it's become clear to me is, if I'm an angry person, if I have no peace, you know, if the conflict has already penetrated my shell and dwells within, and you come up to me as an ambassador of peace, the disorder in my life is basically a peace repellent. So when you offer your peace to me, it gets rejected and bounces off and returns to you because I have no place in me for peace. I have too much hostility in me. I have been that person. I have been, I'm sure we've all been that person at one point. Let us never be that person again. Amen. Let us always be agents of peace. And when somebody of peace comes up to me, I just want to soak up your peace. I want to be able to come up to somebody and because I've established trust, because I have a history of being a person of peace, that when I come in your presence and I bring peace with me, that you can receive that. That's how we build each other up by being agents of peace. Amen. I have a quote here I want to share with you. Um, it's not from uh, John Wesley, so please don't be too disappointed. But this is from C.S. Lewis, and it says, God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself because it's not there. There's no such thing. We can, we can say that we have peace, if we define it as the absence of conflict. But real peace, that sense of tranquility, of wholeness, of true welfare, only comes from God. True peace. And again, just like the word love, the world can pervert the definition of it to say that they have it, but true love comes from above. True peace also. So for me, I'm just going to share with you that this week was a little difficult for me. Um, it was a busy work week. It was, you know, mostly work related. And, you know, life is normally, I have a certain level of chaos in my life. Uh, not this kind of chaos, but, you know, between the day job, the schools, the seminary classes, the sermon prep, the men's stuff, and I mean... I, I run pretty close to red line, you know, a lot of the time. And um, when work gets a little extra hectic and it feels like 
I'm, you know, I'm no longer juggling the balls. They're actually being thrown at me. You know, it, it can affect my peace. And this week, I, I was there. Um, I remember one morning I woke up, went to my wife, and I said, I feel, I forget what, how I worded it, but I'm like, I feel like I have a little black rain cloud over my head. My peace is a little shaky today, you know, and I can feel it. And I just want to let you know that I can feel it. And for me, that's absolutely, you know, in addition to prayer, that was absolutely the best thing I could have done um, was to share that with her. For me, it acknowledged that I am in tune with my peace. And when my peace is being threatened or under attack or just a little, you know, the, the bubble's a little off from plum, you know, it's nice to be able to recognize that. So just being able to recognize it was a good thing. Being able to verbalize, to acknowledge and verbalize it is a powerful step in dealing with it. And that's true of all things, you know. If you talk to people uh, in recovery or other things, you know, you have to verbalize it. You have to acknowledge it, first step. The next thing that really helped me by sharing this with my wife was um, I opened myself up to some accountability. Because I'm pretty sure, you know, once I said that, later on in the day, it was like, so, how did you do today? <laughs> you snap at anybody? How's your peace right now? Where are you at? You know, and, and I knew I was going to get that checkup later on, so it helped me keep it in the forefront of my thought of, okay, I know my peace is a little wonky right now. I need to be extra, extra guarded in my conduct because I want to not do the 1% serial killing of my peace, you know, and impact other people. So uh, the uh, accountability was a great thing. And, you know, also by just sharing with somebody like, you know, my piece is kind of off, it invited prayer. I mean, and I can be even more over and say, you know, can you please pray for me? I'm, I just don't feel right today, you know, I, and I don't want to go off on anybody. And I can tell you that from that moment, things changed for me. You know, I, I went into the day and I realized that my coworkers were kind of in the same boat because we're all getting assaulted. And, it, you know, when I started that day with a different mindset, it allowed me to, you know, be more affirming, more encouraging to my coworkers. You know, and in doing that, it helped me with my peace because I was being that agent of peace. And the, the more you just, you know, build up and edify others, the more we benefit from that as well. Yeah. So as a result, by the end of that day, you know, things were still kind of hectic at work, but the little black rain cloud had dissipated. It had moved on down. Unfortunately, I probably found somebody else, but it was no longer on me. So I was very, very grateful for that. Um, and so today we lit the, the candle of peace, the candle of shalom, and it's such a beautiful, beautiful gift that we have. And I just wanted to, to talk about, you know, verse 7 a little bit. And in verse 7 it said, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our examples, because we did not act in an undisciplined way among you. Discipline. Discipline and self-discipline is the antidote to disorder. You want less disorder in your life? Become more disciplined. Get control of your actions, your choices, the things you do, the things you think about, the things you allow into your head, the people you interact with, the people you allow to influence you. Become more disciplined, as Paul references here, and you can have order. Discipline yourself, embrace peace, embrace harmony, embrace uh, tranquility, embrace shalom, and protect it with fierceness. Amen? Amen. So let's go over our takeaways for today. Takeaway number one, keep away from every brother or sister who leads a disorderly life and not one in accordance with the traditions 
which you received from us. All of them, not just the ones we like. Uh, number two, disorderly equals non, not producing spiritual fruit or works. I should have had works on the back of that. Um, disorderly, not producing. Next one. Focus on your section of the rope and pull with all your might. That's how we serve the Lord. Next one. We are called to be servants and laborers for his goodness and glory. Not lazy. Next, love everyone, but don't let their disorder and chaos into your life and actions. Next, God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. That's a good thing to remember. Next, recognize the warning signs of your peace being disrupted. Pray about it. Share it with a confidant. Have a confidant. And lastly, discipline and self-discipline is the antidote to disorder. Preserve your peace. Acquire your peace, first of all, you know, through Jesus Christ. Acquire that peace. Just let it overwhelm you when you need it. And, um, and fight fiercely for it. Let's close in prayer. <sighs> Father God, thank you for your peace. Thank you for these brothers and sisters in the Lord. Thank you for your word that we can follow. Thank you for the traditions and scriptures. Thank you for self-discipline. Thank you for your love and joy and all the things of the season that bring us peace. Just pray that you would be with us, that you would guide our actions, that you would prevent us from doing anything that would uh, harm our trust or the trust people have in us, that they would see us and see us as your agents of peace and love. And we just praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Shalom to you all. Go in peace, harmony, and tranquility of the Lord.